This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, really great to be with you. I am Glenn. I am Emma's husband. I'm Ruby and JJ's dad. I live on the south coast of England in a place called Eastbourne. Anybody know Eastbourne at all? Anybody been to Eastbourne? Oh, really? Gosh. It's known as the Sunshine Coast, which my Australian family thinks is hilarious. We have a Sunshine Coast in Australia. It's a little different. You can hear your skin audibly crackling on the Sunshine Coast in Australia. Not so much in Eastbourne, but it's lovely. It's nice. It's known as kind of the retirement capital of the UK, which it's, it's the sort of place where all the shop windows are bifocal. It's that, it's that kind of place. It's known as God's waiting room, so it's a good place to be a Church of England minister, which I am, and uh, I'm also an evangelist, which means I shoot my mouth off about Jesus. That's my day job. I work for a charity called Speak Life, and that frees me up to be able to go around to churches and schools and universities and anywhere that will have me uh, to talk about Jesus, because I'm convinced that he has the answers to our deepest questions. And tonight we're asking the deepest question, really, the question about God. Does anyone believe in God anymore? How can you believe in God when faith seems impossible? I meet a lot of people who tell me that they could never believe. I had a friend write me a letter and they said, uh, Glenn, of course you realize I could never have faith. And they just went on in the letter and it really struck me. It, it's, it's, it sat with me for years since my friend said, Glenn, of course you realize I could never have faith. And I think my friend considers faith to be a little bit like the Force in Star Wars. You know how in, in the old school Star Wars, you know, episodes four, five, six, the Force was this sort of mystical thing that people had or didn't have, and there was the light side of the Force and the dark side of the Force. And then when they had the prequels that came in later, it became a much more scientific definition of the Force, didn't it? And it became all about midichlorians in the blood, right? And some people have a lot of midichlorians in the blood, which means they have a lot of Force in them. And some people don't have so much midichlorians in the blood. I think my friend thinks of faith like that. It's something that you're either born with or you don't. My friends missed out on the great lottery. I happened to get lucky. And so I'm a person of faith and they're not. Is that what faith is for you? Or some people think faith is basically the ability to conceive of things that you could not possibly know to be true. And to cling to those things fervently, even though you know it's a nonsense. And so some people look on that ability to believe in things you know aren't true. And some people look on that kind of favorably and think it's brave. Most people look on that unfavorably and think it's stupid, it's nuts, bonkers to believe. Other people think of faith a little bit like, um, you know, Indiana Jones. In Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, there is that moment where Indy has to cross the great chasm. And there's no way across. Do you know this scene? It's sort of, every Christmas it sort of comes out, doesn't it, on ITV or something? And, and there is Indy and he has to. It's one of the great challenges that he has to make. And his sort of father is sending him a message about believing. And it's a leap of faith. And Indy, if he's brave enough, if he's bold enough, he will step out onto, well, apparently nothing. And yet because he's a hero, Obviously, Indy takes the great step and then, thunk, his boot lands on something solid. There was an invisible savior. It was okay. And brave Indy makes his way across. And many people think of, of faith in terms of a leap of faith. It's the sort of thing where you think of yourself on one side and, and you think God and angels and heaven and all that spiritual stuff is on the other and you couldn't possibly know it's true, but you'd just make a leap anyway. Is that what you think of as faith? Nonsense. No, none of that is faith. Faith is just trust. It's just another word for trust, okay? And every single person in this room has trust. And we have trust on, on two basic levels. 
we have a deepest trust about what life is ultimately about, and we have a daily trust where we just move out into the world and we, we have to trust people. And we have to trust that the world is a certain way just to get by in life. I'll give you some examples. So a deepest trust kind of thing might be you think that all of reality just boils down to physics, right? You, you think that your experience of tonight is just psychology and that just boils down to your biology and your biology just boils down to your chemistry, and your chemistry just boils down to your physics, and then at the physical level there's just quarks and leptons bashing into each other like billiard balls. That's all that's going on, right? At the deepest level of reality, it's just matter in motion, right? That, that might be your deepest understanding of what holds this world together. Well, that for you, I guess, is God, right? I guess matter in motion is God. There is an impersonal force that is grinding along and everybody dances to its tune, okay? And for you, you, you have a sense, I guess, of God. You wouldn't probably call it God if these were your beliefs, but you have a sense of deepest reality, how life actually works, okay? And that's the deepest reality. And yet, you probably also, on a day-to-day -day basis, Trust people, love people, give people the benefit of the doubt. You probably think that a society should be judged by the way it treats its weakest members, right? Everyone loves that kind of sentiment, don't they? You know, they put it on Facebook, it gets loads of likes, right? Put it on Twitter, it's, it's, a, it's less than 280 characters, it's the sort of thing, loads of retweets. A society should be judged by the way it treats its weakest members. And you probably live that kind of way. You, you probably live your life today, even if your deepest faith is that everything is just billiard balls clacking together, probably today you were kind. You were loving. You didn't treat other human beings as though they were just machines. You probably treated them with a heck of a lot of dignity, and respect, and kindness, and benevolence. And really tonight, all I want to do is say, does that match up with that? Because on a day-to-day -day basis, you're leaning into a whole bunch of beliefs about who people are and how they operate and how you should operate. But I think a lot of people today, especially people who don't consider themselves to be people of faith, they live with a real split. And the split goes something like this. You believe on the one hand that we are just biological survival machines. And on the other hand, you think that the weak and the marginalized and the disabled and the poor should be given a helping hand. You think, what? How, how, but you really believe that, don't you? I bet everybody in this room really believes that. If you don't really believe that, you get kicked off Facebook. They don't like that. Like it's, it's, not, it's not polite in society to live without those sorts of beliefs. But do you notice how the belief that people are, are worthy of infinite respect, that life is sacred, that you should love your neighbor, maybe you should even love your enemy. Like, like you probably lean into those beliefs and you probably trust in that kind of a world on a day-by-day -day basis. And I'm just saying, pick one. Because if you believe that we are just biological survival machines clinging to an insignificant rock, hurtling through a meaningless universe towards eternal extinction, it doesn't make sense to live the life that you're living. If you really believe that deepest thing about life, you'd be living a different kind of way day by day. You just would. And yet people do this all the time. People, people often say, I think basically underneath it all, it's just physics, it's just matter in motion. And at the same time, they're really sure that Vladimir Putin is wrong. Right? So a lot of people, they, they, they just believe survival of the fittest is the deepest explanation for why we are here on planet Earth. Survival of the fittest is the deepest explanation for life on Earth, and Vladimir Putin is wrong. No, 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 no. Pick one. You can't have both beliefs. 
But you really believe this one, don't you? You really actually believe on a day-by-day basis in love and respect and kindness. And Let me give you some ground beneath your feet. I don't want you to take a leap of faith tonight. I want you to get, get some ground beneath your feet, okay? Richard Dawkins once said that the universe we observe has the exact properties we would expect if at bottom there is nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. That's what Richard Dawkins, the great scientist, says is at the bottom of everything. That's the deepest belief for a Richard Dawkins, blind, pitiless indifference. In the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33, there's a great song, and it says, underneath are the everlasting arms. Which do you think is true? See, I I think probably we live our lives a lot more on a day-by-day basis as though love is the deepest reality. We probably do. Don't know how you would describe your beliefs, but I bet, I bet that you aspire to living as though love is the deepest reality. I bet you aspire to a, a life of love, and tonight I've got good news for you. I think underneath there really are everlasting arms of love. Underneath, there is a God of love who makes sense of all your other beliefs. A God who makes sense of all the things you long to be true. Well, because of Jesus, you can believe in this God and your life can start to make sense. You can start to connect the day-by-day faith that you have with the deepest realities that you say exist. It all makes sense with Jesus. Let me kick it off with uh, three questions that we should ask ourselves. Okay, three, three questions that then the Bible is going to answer for us. Okay, up on the screen, here are these three questions. It's about what you picture when it comes to the issue of God. When it comes to the issue of God, first question, what is your picture of God? I want you to think, what is your picture of God? When when I say the word God, what springs to mind? And then secondly, what is your picture of Jesus? Again, I just say the word Jesus. What's the the word association? What's What's the brain chemistry that's happening when I say the name Jesus? And then, what's God's picture of you? Oh, that's a different kind of a question, isn't it? What I want right now is for you to think of what what your gut reactions to those three questions are. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a a few verses from the Bible, from the New Testament, and we'll see how God's Word informs our guts. Okay? Should we have a look at that? Let's work through uh, some words that the Apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, what he wrote to a church in Colossae, which we would call uh, modern Turkey these days. Um, Let me just... Work, work our way through some of these verses from the New Testament. And we'll see how the Apostle Paul answers these three questions. What is your picture of God? What is your picture of Jesus? And what is God's picture of you? So on the next slide, Paul begins like this. He says, the Son, he's talking about Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. The Son is the image of the invisible God. Oh, well, that's interesting. See, when I asked you to picture God, you were probably scratching your head, weren't you? Thinking, well, how do I do that? And if I'd actually zoomed in on each of you to ask you that question, I would have had as many answers to that question as there are people in this room. It's really difficult to picture God, isn't it? I've got a friend who just thinks of a reassuring hand on their shoulder, another friend who just thinks of a bright, shining light. Many people, they just think of a distant power with a beard and a thunderbolt ready to hurl, right? What do you picture when you picture God? It's really difficult. You know why it's difficult? He's invisible. What do you picture when you picture God? Well, nobody really knows, right? That's that's the thing. We all think we know what God is like. But so often when somebody tells you what God is like, really they're just telling you what they are like. Have you ever noticed that in ancient cultures, really warring tribes have believed in warring gods? Yeah? Or intellectual peoples 
have thought that God is some great mind? That's suspicious, isn't it? Or really groovy people think that God is a really groovy vibe, right? It's really suspicious. It's almost as though the heavens are like a big mirror and we look up and we, we claim to be seeing into the heavens. Really, we're just seeing ourselves. So often when people say the word God, they're just saying the word humanity in a loud voice, right? It's really difficult to know what God is like. God is invisible. But there's good news in that verse, isn't there? The Son is the image of the invisible God. Oh, that's good news, right? I don't know what God's like. You don't know what God's like. But then the Son of God shows up. And even that word, the Son, it's, it's kind of like he's a chip off the old block, right? Exactly like his father. He is the image of what God is like. What's God like? I don't know. Jesus comes and he shows up on planet Earth and he stoops and he serves and he suffers and he bleeds and he dies on a cross. And all the while the Bible is saying that's what it looks like to be God. That's what God's like. And humanity's like, no way. And the Bible's like, yeah, way. This is, this is what God is like. He is the one who stretches his arms out to the world, bleeding even for his enemies, praying, Father, forgive. According to the Bible, you've never seen anything more divine than Jesus Christ on that cross, arms open even to his enemies. What is God like? Everybody's got opinions. According to the Bible, there is... A definitive visitation that has happened. Jesus has come and he's shown us the kind of God you can believe in. I don't know what you trust. I don't know where your faith is this evening. Is it in blind, pitiless indifference? Is it in physical part particles clacking together like billiard balls? Or maybe Underneath are the everlasting arms. There is a son of a father who is full of the Holy Spirit. And he is the reason behind this world. That's what the Bible says. Before there was a universe, before there were people or planets or protons, there was this son loved by his father, filled by his spirit. Before there was a world, there was love. And we have come from love. We've been shaped by love. We are intended for love. Which makes sense of your day-to-day -day existence, doesn't it? You know, tonight when your head hits the pillow, today will have been a good day if you've connected well with other people. Won't it? Today will be a great day if you have loved and been loved. That's kind, of the, that's kind of the ultimate measurement of whether today is a good day, isn't it? If you've loved and been loved today, it's a great day. On the other hand, if today there has been disconnection, if relationships have gone south, if things have gotten twisted, if you have failed to love, and if you have not been loved today, Today's a hell of a day, right? Love when it goes well, it's heaven. Love when it goes wrong, it's hell. It's the ultimate measurement, isn't it? You live today by that. You live by love. And I'm just telling you, deepest reality, it's true. It's true. Underneath there are everlasting arms. Because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is what God is like. You know, Byron, the poet, he said, if God is not like Jesus Christ, he ought to be. It's actually a very biblical understanding. He just needed to complete the thought. If God is not like Jesus Christ, he ought to be. Good news, though. God is entirely and exactly like Jesus. The God who loves you more than his own life. The God who would bleed his own heart's blood for you. The God who would go to hell and back for for you. That's the God who is there. And this is the God who makes sense 
of your day-to-day -day life. This is the God you can trust. Paul goes on. The Son is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. That just means he's the heir, the inheritor of all things. Next slide. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. Next slide. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Next slide. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Next slide. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. A cosmic portrait of Jesus. I hope you see from this, a lot, of, a lot of stuff that I, I don't yet understand. I've been pressing into these verses for a couple of decades now, and they still elude me. There's so much in here, but here's one thing you should get from that. Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, he's not just the inventor of a religion. Did you catch it? He's the inventor of the universe. It's a big picture of Jesus, isn't it? It's a huge picture of Jesus. But Christians who have encountered who Jesus is, we just think to ourselves, well, there's no other explanation for the, for the grandeur of the person of Jesus. Jesus is, is utterly God-sized. And God is utterly Jesus-shaped. Jesus is utterly God-sized. Jesus is utterly God-sized and God is utterly Jesus-shaped. This is the God who we believe in, not just a, a force or a power in the sky, not just a distant individual with a thunderbolt ready to hurl, but one with his arms outstretched to the whole world. Did you notice how the paragraph that began with, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the paragraph ends with the blood of his cross. And you think, how do those two things go together? On the one hand, we've got this idea of God, and, and God is this... Idea. He's the source of all life and being. He's a, he's a fountain, overflowing. And the Bible says, yes, and you know where you see the fountain expended. That's where you see the fountain most truly. When the fountain is poured out, there you know what the fountain is truly like. Jesus Christ is poured out with every drop of his blood, and he's showing you what God is like. He's a God of life. He's a God of love, and he's poured himself out. So we've asked our two questions. First question is, when you picture God, what do you picture? Well, we should picture Jesus. And then our second question is, when you picture Jesus, what do you picture? Well, he's not just the preacher on the mount, is he? He's not just gentle Jesus, meek and mild, is he? He is cosmic. He is God-sized. And he's the reconciler, the redeemer, the rescuer. Because he does what love does, right? When love sees the beloved in trouble, what does love do? Love plunges down into the pit. Isn't that what love does? If you see someone, they're in trouble. Don't you say, your trouble will be my trouble. If they're in debt, you might say, your debt will be my debt. So what does Jesus do? He plunges down into the pit. He says, your trouble will be my trouble. I'm going to face off against your oppressors. I'm going to pay off your debts. Which again is why you've never seen anything more divine than Jesus with his arms outstretched. Because what's he doing? He's paying off your debts, your sins. That's what love does. Just to be with the beloved, just to be for them. Just to rescue them. So, what does God look like? Jesus. What does Jesus look like? He's the cosmic creator of all things who spreads his arm to the whole world to bring peace between heaven and earth. And then I ask that final question, that awkward one. When God thinks of you, what does he picture? That's a much more uncomfortable question, isn't it? And we often get this question wrong. Church people get it wrong. Those outside the church get it wrong. Everybody gets it wrong. We all think that the way God looks at us is a bit like a dimmer switch. 
you know, a dimmer switch. Sometimes it's brighter, sometimes it's murkier. We often think it's like that with God. We often think on our good days, we love well, we connect with people, we help old grannies across the road, right? And the light gets turned up on the, on the brightness. But then on the next day, we do not love well. We miss connecting with other people. We run over three or four grannies on the road and it's just like, oh dear. The light goes down, it's a bit murkier at that stage. And so we think that we, we sort of are constantly going back and forwards between some days a bit brighter, some days a bit murkier. That's not how it is in the Bible, actually. In the Bible, it's off or on. It's literally off or on. Let's have a look on the next verse. Here's what Paul says. He says to a whole bunch of people who've become Christians, but he says, look, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. That's the off position. And it kind of makes sense because if all things have been made by Jesus and for Jesus, the big question is, are you for Jesus? He is most definitely for you. Look at the cross. His arms are wide open for you. All things are for him, but are you for him? And if you're not, you're... You're going against the grain of the universe. You're going to get splinters. That's the off position. If you're disconnected from life, life himself, then you're going to be perishing. If you are away from the light, then you will be in the darkness. That is the off position. But the good news is on the next slide. The good news is, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in God's sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. That's brilliant. No longer in the off position, totally now in the on position. Because what's happened? Christ has plunged down into our pit. He's taken on all our darkness. He's put it to death on the cross. He's raised up again, and he drags us into the kingdom of light drags us into God's good graces, brings us into the light and love of God. And now we have these, these three beautiful adjectives to describe us, holy in God's sight. That means we are God's special stuff. We're His, His glittering ones, His precious ones, holy in His sight, without blemish, unblameable, and free from accusation. The switch is either off or it's on. And really the whole Bible is just saying, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus because in him you will find a God you can believe in. In him you can find a sense of meaning that gives significance to your day-to-day -day life. In him you can connect with the love that both predated and produced the universe. In him, you can go from death to life, from darkness to light, from off to on. It's as simple as putting your hand into the hand of Jesus and saying, I trust you. I trust you more than I trust myself. Everyone in this room is a person of faith. We all live by certain values, certain gut instincts. We all trust. Unfortunately, we all trust ourselves more than we trust God. It's kind of the human condition. But Jesus calls us to look again at him and ask ourselves, can I trust Jesus? Can I trust Jesus more than I trust myself? If you can, you're a believer in that biblical sense. You have a faith when faith seems impossible. And you, can ha you have a God that you can truly trust. If that's a journey you want to take tonight, then you can talk to one of the ministers here. We've got a prayer team as well. You can call out to God and you can say, I want to go from off to on, from darkness to light, from death to life. 
I want to come home to God. Uh, if you do that tonight, I'd love to give you a little book called Love Story. Uh, it shows you again some of these deep truths that we've been talking about tonight. But I'd love you to take that step tonight and then to let us help you take your first fledgling, f fledgling steps in faith in Jesus. Well, that's about enough from me. Um, Adam, are there any questions? So yeah, we've had, uh, we've had lots of good questions, so thank you very much indeed. And you can still ask questions on slido.com, please feel free to do that. And I'll take, I'll take one simple, nice simple one to start off with <laughs> uh, from this list before we open it up to, uh, to everybody in the church. So someone asks, how can we tell which monotheistic religion is the correct one? Mm. I don't know why the, the questioner has picked monotheistic religions necessarily, right. but, but that's the question. Why, how, do you, how do you know what, which religion is the right one? Okay, so in terms of monotheism, it's uh, just a word that means one God. And so I guess there's a, a whole bunch of people who believe there is just one God. Um, probably historically, the most popular uh, version of, of religion and spirituality is to think in terms of uh, polytheism. Um, but uh, certainly Jews and Muslims and Christians and those who you'd call philosophical theists, they all believe in, in one God. Um, how do you sort of arbitrate between, uh, yeah, who is, who is the right one? I would just keep on coming back to that person of Jesus. We saw in that verse, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, the Son, that is Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. And at that point, that is a, a point of distinction, a point of difference. Uh, between all those different groups of people that I, that I just mentioned. Um, the, the Jews would not say that Jesus is the Son of God in that way. Muslims say that Allah has no son and he is not a father. And so uh, Jesus is simply a prophet within Islam. And within philosophical theism, it's, it's just, um, it does not rely on the revelation of God, God revealing himself to us. So Christians, we, we stand or fall on this one person. So I would just say, have a look at Jesus, pick up a gospel, shoot up a prayer, and ask yourself, does he look like the God of all creation? Does he look like the source of all life? And I have to say that when I sort of read through Luke's gospel, for instance, about 20 years ago, I remember just getting to the point halfway through Luke's gospel, just seeing Christ's towering personality, his stooping love, and just thinking to myself, he's it. Whoever else God is, God must be this one. And I, I made that uh, kind of realization about 20 years ago. And I, I pray that it's something that uh, people here can make as well. Okay, so we had a couple of questions that are on a, a, a similar theme. And it was from something you said quite early on in your talk. And you talked about the difference between values, having a value, and the belief that we are just material beings. We are ultimately just physics. And someone has asked, why are those two things in contradiction? Why can't you have both? Mm. Aren't they just different spheres that the spiritual is one sphere and the material is, is the other? Ex explain why you have to make a choice. So take the, take the example of Vladimir Putin that I used. Okay, so if survival of the fittest is the ultimate biological explanation for life on this planet, then in one sense, what has Vladimir Putin done wrong, right? Now, we might not like the way he's gone about his war. We might, we might think that if I was in charge, I'd do something different. But is he not living according to the dictates of biological reality? Is he not being the fittest and saying, I will survive, and, and a, weaker, uh, a weaker sovereign nation will suffer because I am the stronger? And if, if survival of the fittest is all there is, um, then really he hasn't done anything wrong. He might have done something that you disapprove of. And I, I, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room disapproves of what he's done. I certainly do. The Bible certainly does. But on what basis do we disapprove of what he's done? And are we just saying, I don't like it? Or are we saying, it's wrong? And it's wrong with a capital W. See, C.S. Lewis became a Christian when he started to press into this question. He, he, he said, we would never have the idea of a crooked line if we didn't also have the idea of a straight line. 
Think about it this way. If there was no such thing as a straight line, not even a conceptual reality of a straight line, then you also don't have a crooked line. Lines are just lines. And why would you expect them to be straight? And he says there's something similar going on in the world. We look out at the world and we don't just see, oh, Putin's invaded Ukraine. Oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting development in world history. We don't say that. We say that's wrong. We say that's crooked. Well, if it's crooked, what's the straight line? There is no straight line in nature. Biological reality has nothing to say on whether what Putin did was right or wrong. But everyone here thinks it's wrong. And hopefully we, we can push towards thinking it's wrong with a capital W, but if it's wrong with a capital W, there's something right with a capital R. And that thing that's right exists far above biological reality. It, it, it exists above nature. It is supernatural. And if you're really going to make moral claims about this world, you cannot simply make them on the natural plane. You do need that supernatural element. That's what C.S. Lewis came to see, and, and it moved him from atheism to, to belief in God. Okay, so we're going to pause on some of the online questions for a minute and take a couple of questions from the floor. Where are my glamorous assistants wheeling mic? So, Brian, you're moving a bit slowly to, to be carrying that mic tonight. This is a poor man who's a broken rib or two. Um, so throw, throw up your hand if you'd like to ask a question from the floor. There's, there's, there's one there, that kind of rowdy looking guy in the, in the middle there. Go ahead. Yeah. This morning, I met a young mother who had just left her child in the nursery. And I just innocently said to her, I don't know much about her, you know what I mean? I just said, uh, will I tell, tell the children this week, because it's Holy Week, the story about Jesus? She says to me, I hope not. Mm. I was taken back. I'd never had any occasion to talk to her, but I know her and I know the child. And, we got in, and, and I'm not clever as far as heaven and earth is, but uh, she says that there is no God. She says, I don't know who made this, who done that. You know, look out to the fields and look at all that. And uh, I says, are you an atheist? She says, I am. She says, what about your siblings? She says, I'm an only child. And she says, what about your parents? They're atheists too. And, and I was lost. I had to tell her out of it, you know what I mean? And at the end of it, I, I stupidly said, well, your child will probably get an Easter egg this week from, from that, and that represents a stone rolling away from the tomb. And she just looked at me, and I says, uh, I tell you what, you mightn't think there's a God, but I want to have a prayer for you tonight. And she had no answer, and she walked away. So atheist, what is he atheist? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I often say to people, they, they say, if they say I don't believe in God, I often ask, well, which God don't you believe in? Um, and, and I'm very serious about that because I, as we did this exercise together, I said, what, what do you picture when you picture God? And there are so many different answers in this room. And, and when somebody is asked which God they don't believe in, it's very, it's very similar the answers that they give. They usually give the answer of the distant individual, high on power, low on personality, big beard, thunderbolt, ready to hurl. And then I usually say, well, that, that sounds like Zeus. Um, I don't believe in Zeus. We agree on the God you don't believe in. And, and so often when, when, when I talk to people who have rejected God, the God they have rejected, I also reject. It's, it's often worth just pressing into what is it that they've walked away from? Because if it wasn't for Jesus, I, 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 I describe myself as a, a little bit like the, the woman who has grown up always against the institution of marriage. Imagine a woman, she says, I, I could never be married. I, I hate the institution of marriage. And then later on in life, she meets a guy and she falls in love. And maybe she even marries him. Well, why does she marry him? Does she now believe in marriage? Well, not so much, but she believes in him, and he has converted her. And I'm the same way with, with God. Like, the idea of God, I could take or leave. I, I don't warm to the idea of institutional religion. I don't warm to the idea that there's some kind of a deity. I don't really care about that. But I've met a guy. I've met this Jesus, and he's converted me. 
He's converted me to the kind of God that I can trust and I can believe in. And so I, I, I often press into, into that question with people. I don't believe in God. Well, which God don't you believe in? We might have common ground here. You might have rejected a God that I also reject, but can I tell you about Jesus? That would be some of the ways that I'd seek to develop that conversation. Thank you, Glenn. Anybody else from the floor of the church want to ask a question? Just raise your hand. Just a gentleman here at the front, please, Brian. Well, actually, it's not a question, but can I give a statement of what you already said? I knew, and here's the answer for the guy behind, I knew a atheist, and we had this big argument about God and what was going on. I said, well, where did the universe come from? He said out of the blue that I had to give him the most obvious answer. Where did out of the blue come from? Mm. <laughs> Any other questions from the floor? Go ahead. Uh, okay, on. so I work in uh, peace building and with victims of conflict. Mm -hmm. And I suppose one of the big issues that I've often struggled with is the Old Testament stories of the children of Israel and going into the lands. And because to me, um, they sound like genocide, they, they look like genocide. Um, and so I suppose I struggle sometimes with the difference between a modern day jihadist that would feel that it's okay to go and wipe an entire nation out because of a belief in, in God. And, and when I read, I used to teach this stuff in Sunday school as well. Um, and it's, 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 it's probably the biggest struggle that I've had as a Christian, um, and certainly as a peace builder, and somebody who believes in human rights, um, to, uh, to understand or to comprehend um, those stories around uh, genocide. Yeah. So I suppose the question is, is that genocide? Is, yeah. And is that our God? And yeah. So, big question. Yeah, well, I, I think whether you're a Christian or not, I, I don't think anyone reads the book of Joshua, which is the conquest of the land by the children of Israel. No one reads that book without a massive lump in their throat. I think the lump in our throat has been given to us by Jesus. It has been, our moral sensibilities, as we read that story, have been given to us by the one who said, put away the sword, for those who live by the sword will die by the sword. They've been shaped by somebody who died violently and refused to answer violence with violence, but rather turned the other cheek in the most phenomenal thing, and then taught us to turn the other cheek and to love our enemies and all that kind of stuff. So, what do you call the book of Joshua um, without the Christian spectacles that we have in reading it? Well, you call it business as usual, actually. And, and, and again, returning to Vladimir Putin, what do you, what do you call Putin um, when taken out of a, a moral framework that's, that's really quite Christian? You just call it business as usual. This is, this is what Julius Caesar does. This is what Alexander the Great does. I think there's some work to be done going back into Joshua because I think it's actually a really subversive text about warfare. Israel are utterly the minnows in this situation. I think we, we read the book of Joshua as though Joshua is Putin and the land of Canaan is Ukraine and it's exactly the other way around. Um, that actually the Israelites are the David, the Canaanites are the Goliath and they, they gain a victory in the most surprising and subversive way. It, it really, you know, they, they march around the walls of Jericho seven times and blow some trumpets. Um, they, they, they use furniture from the temple. They, they are not a military power. So it, it's a real David and Goliath story. And I, I think even within an Old Testament frame, we are reading that story as the subversion of warfare, actually. And some good, good books to have a look at. Um, uh, Paul Copan has written a book called Is God a Moral Monster? Looking at um, that question. Or um, Joshua Ryan Butler has written a brilliant book called uh, Skeletons in God's Closet. Um, just about is, is the book of Joshua this sort of skeleton in the closet that we're too nervous to press into? I think they, they do a great job of pressing into the Old Testament and seeing how actually the text is subverting all our expectations of warfare. And then, but the ultimate issue is Jesus comes with cheek-turning love, saying, put away your sword. And the New Testament says there is no sword for the Christian whatsoever, except for the sword of the spirits, the spiritual sword that is the word of God. And all our sensibilities about how we ought to 
negotiate and persuade rather than dominate and conquer, um, they have been given to us by the Christian revolution. Um, and so, again, it's, it's one of those cases where um, even the problems we have with the Bible have been given to us by the Bible. Because it's the Bible that itself makes us think, you know, you should try to persuade, you shouldn't conquer. You should put away your sword. Who taught us that? Well, it's, it's Jesus who taught us that. So I, I would come back to him most centrally, but um, yeah, I hope some of those things help as you wrestle with that. Everyone wrestles with it. Yeah. I'm going to take a couple of questions together that are, that are really about sin. Okay. And one is, how does sin or unconfessed sin hinder our faith? And another one that's, that's very similar is, once we become Christians, does God ever get disappointed in us? Hmm. Um, I think all sin comes from unbelief. Um, in fact, Romans chapter 14, verse 23 says exactly that. All sin comes from unbelief. We don't trust God to be our source of life and blessing, and so we go after life and blessing in other things. We look for love in all the wrong places. And, so it, and it becomes a kind of an addictive cycle. If God is this fountain of life, then we often go off to sex, money, power, experiences, relationships, all these other things as mini fountains of life. And we, we kind of get addicted to those things rather than the, the great Niagara Falls of, of God's love. And, it, and so absolutely, um, we start to mistrust God. We go after life in all these other ways. And it kind of grabs us and addicts us. And we shrink our expectations. We shrink our, our sense of, of life. And, um, but we, we keep going after love in all the wrong places. So th that is definitely a cycle that we, we kind of get into. What's the way out of that cycle? It's to look again at the fountain, look again at just how gushing God's love and blessing really is in Jesus. And that's kind of why we do church, really. It's why we kind of help one another. Because I, I get addicted to all the wrong things during the week, and I need to come back and here again, the good news, God is exactly as you see him in Jesus. He is the God who still has his arms wide open to you, no matter what a mess you've made of this week. And I need to hear that every week. And so, again, if you want to do the Jesus thing, um, I would really recommend you need Jesus' people to, to help you with that. And then that second question was... Well, it's about whether God ever is disappointed in us. Sure. Yeah, and that's, that, that can be true. Um, in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about uh, God's fatherly disciplining. And, and it says, you know, what father does not discipline his children? And if you're not disciplined, then it's almost as, as though you, you, you've been orphaned. You, you, you haven't been taken care of by a father. So there, there can be in that sense. Um, but if you're a child of a father, you have an unlosable love, right? If you're in on this kind of love, there might be times when God is disappointed with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is not that kind of a father. But can there be disappointment? Sure. Okay, we have time for one more question, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to take it from the floor of the church if there is one. And if not, we'll go on live. Anybody got a burning question they'd like to ask from the floor of the church? No? Okay. So, um, this one, again, um, is, is related probably to someone who already has a Christian, Christian faith. Mm -hmm. But this person asks, it's a very personal question, is it wrong to think that your faith fades as life seems difficult? How can you remain strong in hard times? Thank you very much. And that's everybody, really. So I was in this very building last night, and I was speaking about Mary Magdalene, uh, who was the world's most ardent believer on Easter Sunday. She was there early on Easter Sunday morning. And she was in a total flap, and she was anxious, and she was surrounded by angels, and she even bumped into Jesus and didn't recognize Jesus, right? And so, is she a believer? Yes. Is she full of doubts? Yes. And yet, Jesus encounters her, and he speaks her name, and he says, Mary. And all of a sudden, the lights go on, and she recognizes, oh, it's Jesus. And it's Jesus who's gone through death for her, 
It's Jesus who's come out the other side and he still knows her name. It's still personal. He still loves her. And she's overwhelmed again by the love of Jesus. And I, and I think, again, that is, that is what church is for. Um, am I a believer? Yes. Do I have doubts? Yes. Does my belief flag all the time? Do difficult times make it harder to trust? Yes. Yes, they really do. But the reason why we have one another is so that we can carry one another. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, was a great pastor who stood up against the Nazis in World War II and paid with his own life. And he, he wrote a book just before he died called Life Together. And he was wrestling with the question, why do we do church? Why, why don't we all just scatter as little individual Jesus followers? And he gave this one brilliant line. He said, we need one another because the Christ in my own heart is weak. But the Christ in the word of a brother or sister is strong. What does he mean? He, he, he means that when I tell myself that Jesus loves me, it gives me some little comfort. But when Adam eyeballs me and he says, Jesus loves you and gave himself for you, it's like, whoa, that, that really conquers doubt and unbelief. So if you, are, if you are struggling, do not struggle alone. First, you need to know it's, it's Jesus who meets you in the valley of the shadow of death. It's Jesus who joins you in your struggle. And it's his grasp of you that is far more important than your grasp of him. Your grasp of him is weak. Sometimes it's like... We don't even feel him. That does not mean that he's stopped holding on to us. And we need one another. We, we need to know Christ is with us in the trials, and we also need one another. We need one another to say it's okay. People who can pray for us when we can no longer pray for ourselves, who can hope for us when we can no longer hope in ourselves. So we need Jesus and we need his people. But don't be surprised that you find your faith flagging. Don't be surprised at that. But that's precisely why you come among the people of God in all your anxieties and you hear your name spoken by Jesus again and he carries you and God's people carry you. That's the way it's meant to be. Thank you very much indeed, Glenn. Mm -hmm. um, we are out of time. Thank you for sharing with us and thank you for subjecting yourself to that <laughs> Q&A which was incredibly brave. Let's just give Glenn a, a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast with worship services at 11am and 7pm every Sunday. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.